All right, this month we're going to look at how to do uh, dynamic CUDA with NVIDIA's runtime compilation library. And uh, before we have talked about how to do basic CUDA uh, using CMake. CMake has CUDA language support built in, so you don't have to teach it how to compile CUDA files, CUDA source files. If you just add a .cu source file to your CMake project with the CUDA language support enabled, it'll just know to invoke MVCC, which is the CUDA compiler. <coughs> and at CMake configure time, it'll locate the uh, CUDA compiler to make sure that the language support is enabled. So um, that part is all pretty straightforward. What we're going to look at today is how to do CUDA compilation at runtime. So the library is called MVRTC and it comes in uh, the header files to access that library come with the CUDA toolkit which you can install for free. You don't need the CUDA toolkit deployed on a machine in order to uh, execute runtime compilation. The, the corresponding DLL it ships with the driver so as long as you have an NVIDIA driver installed, then you can access that functionality at runtime. So that simplifies things for customers deploying your application on somebody else's desktop, for instance. As long as they have an appropriate CUDA driver, everything's going to run just fine. You don't need to ask them to install the compiler and then ask them to install the CUDA toolkit, uh, the uh, SDK, the CUDA SDK. You don't need to ask them to do any of that stuff. However, because the compiler is invoked at runtime and there's no host compiler around, there are some limitations. And the limitations revolve around the kind of code that you can compile. And although you're compiling C++ you know, CUDA files, you can't compile any host code, so you can only compile code that is targeting the GPU. In CUDA, this is designated with the double underscore device attribute, which we'll, we'll see that in a second. So you can't compile code to the host. You can only compile code to the GPU. And you um, are responsible for supplying instructions for how to resolve included files. So with the C++ preprocessor, which is really just the C preprocessor, you can pound include some other file into whatever you're compiling. And we'll see how to handle that <coughs> in this application that I've got developed. Now, in this little program that I've written, um, I am using an open source NVIDIA uh, toolkit called the Optics Toolkit. It's made for uh, writing optics programs, which is a ray tracing API. We're not going to do any ray tracing, but it just happens to be that there's some convenient things about some convenient tools in there for error checking and for taking a buffer in device memory that was written to by a CUDA kernel and then displaying it on the screen in a window. So although I've uh, I've got the optics toolkit pulled in here to this git repo which I will push up to github when the talk is over. I've got it pulled in as a git module, a git sub module uh, in order to access those things just to save me some time so I don't have to cook up a graphical user interface and I don't have to um, cook up this little output buffer utility class and I can utilize the error checking that that they're providing but that's all I'm really using from it <coughs> the uh, the main code that I've written is down here in this MVRTC fractal directory and what I've got in here is two versions of the program one version that uses offline compilation to render the Mandelbrot set and then I've got a version that takes the uh, iteration formula for a fractal and 
as a command line argument and then renders an image and displays it based on that command line argument. So the, the, the one that takes the command line argument is the dynamic one. And what I've done is carved up the uh, source files in such a way that I'm really sharing the same source files between the dynamic and the uh, static version. It's just that the static version only has like uh, one fractal that it can display, namely the standard Mandelbrot set. Uh, if you're not familiar with fractals, it's just a uh, computation in the... It, it, it's a it's an iteration in the complex plane. And if you don't know what complex numbers are, that also doesn't matter. The point is, it's just a uh, iterating formula that generates a, a graphical image. And it's uh, compute intensive, so it's a good candidate for GPU acceleration. But there are... Uh, at the kernel of it, the inner loop, there's many different formulas that you can use to get many different kinds of images out. And the idea here is that you want to be able to supply that inner formula at runtime through some kind of user interface. In my case, I'm just taking a command line argument. It could have gotten fancier with some kind of, you know, text input dialog and have you type it in on the fly and regenerate the image. But we're just going to show how to do it from command line argument. Uh, so the idea is, you've got some GPU accelerated computation. You want to have some portion of that computation vary by user input. And so, instead, because you can't anticipate all possible user inputs, what you're going to do is use runtime compilation to take the user supplied input and use that to modify the CUDA code that we're compiling and then we're going to launch a kernel onto the GPU from that compiled code. So first let's take a look at the, the static version. So here's my static version. I've, I've got it built already. We'll just run it so you can see what the output looks like. So it generates this kind of the standard Mandelbrot fractal image. Uh, just displays it in a window. There's no interaction other than like you press Q or escape to exit out. So it, it generates one image and displays it, and then just waits for you to close the window. Um, if we take a look at what we've got going on here. So um, let's just collapse this for a second. This is just so on Windows, when you build an executable that depends on DLL dependencies, by default, CMake doesn't copy those dependencies to the uh, build directory. And as a result, if you try to run the executable before you've copied the dependencies in there, it'll say, I can't find this DLL. So that little, this little copy dependencies function is just something I wrote to copy the dependencies in there uh, after a successful link. So uh, here's our static version. Uh, we have our little main. This little stubs guy is only needed because I'm depending on some of those utilities from Optics Toolkit. It's not relevant to what we're going to talk about here today. I've got a little complex number data type. I've got a, a thing that defines my formula that I'm going to be iterating. I've got a little piece of CUDA code that um, handles the uh, generation of the image and the launching of the GPU kernel in the static case. And then I've got a piece of CUDA code that implements the inner loop. So let's just kind of drill from the outside in. We'll start with main. So I've got my main here. It's going to run this render function. The render function is going to create this output buffer that I'm uh, grabbing from that optics toolkit. Uh, I, uh, th this map operation gets a pointer to the device memory associated with this output buffer. And then when I call my render routine to render the image into the output buffer, and then unmap, uh, the unmap and map operations are symmetric. Uh, if I were, uh, depending on the kind of uh, output buffer type, I mean, here I'm using a CUDA device buffer, but depending on the, the output buffer type, it may do some like interop with other graphics facilities like OpenGL or things like that. Um, so after doing the unmap operation, I'm going to have uh, an image buffer that I'm going to display. Uh, 
going to get the corresponding host address of the pixels from the output buffer. Uh, build up this little buffer beta structure and then say go ahead and display buffer window. This is this stuff is called coming from optics toolkit so I didn't have to write that. So the main interesting part here that I wrote is this this little render function. And in the uh, static case, just kind of ignore this use launcher here for a second. We'll see what that means. In in regular uh, CU file where that's compiled offline, you can decorate the function as a host function or you can decorate the function as a global function. Global functions are the entry points to kernels that are uh, launched onto the device. Uh, because this code is compiled with the MVCC compiler down here, I can reference this global function. So if we just scroll up a little bit, you can see that that was the name of this global function. Using this so-called triple chevron syntax, and what happens in MVCC when it compiles this offline is it says, oh, this is a host function. You're trying to launch a CUDA kernel. Um, these parameters here are specifying the dimensions of the grid and the dimensions of blocks within the grid. And um, there's an op a further optional parameter there that you can launch things on a CUDA stream. It, you can have multiple CUDA streams in progress is how you do asynchronous uh, kernel launches with CUDA, but we're just going to use the default stream, so there's no stream argument being supplied here. And he, these are the arguments that go to the kernel, uh, which is this function up here. And you can see uh, my little IDE doesn't recognize these built-in CUDA variables, block IDX, block DIM, and thread IDX. Those are how you get at the individual index for a particular thread because this is um, it's not single instruction, multiple data. It's multiple threads, multiple data. Uh, and y you can read in the CUDA SDK about how all of that parallelism works, or you can refer back to our introduction to CUDA talk that we gave a while back. It's on our YouTube channel. Uh, so this is the thread index. Um, if we're outside the bounds of the image, we're just going to bail out of here. Otherwise, we're going to uh, compute where we are within the image as a coordinate in the complex plane that's the here's the real coordinate and the imaginary coordinate we're going to iterate our formula up to at that complex starting at this uh, complex coordinate we're going to iterate our formula up to a maximum number of iterations uh, it's going to tell us how many iterations we got back and if it was a maximum then we'll color the output buffer black opaque black so this is uh, four bytes interpreted as RGBA so this is red green blue of zero which is black and then 255 opacity which is fully opaque otherwise we'll pick a color out of our color map our color map only has six entries uh, so we're going to take the iteration count modulo six to pick a color out of the color map and we'll stick that in the output buffer. So just to refresh ourselves with the image what it looked like when we ran it these colors on the exterior these are the colors that are being picked out of the color map I've chosen really bright distinctive colors so you can easily see the different bands and then all this stuff that's black this is the stuff that reached maximum iteration this is considered to be the interior of this fractal set. So that was the part that was black and then the part that's outside it took a certain number of iterations for us to figure it was figure out that it was outside and we colored those outside portions from the color map. Um, this little launcher function it's just figuring out the uh, the grid dimensions and the block dimensions to launch the kernel um, I'm using a fixed portion of the complex plane from minus two to minus one, uh, minus two to one in the uh, real dimension, and minus 1.5 to plus 1.5 in the imaginary direction. And I'm using 8192 as my maximum iteration count, so I'm letting it run for lots of iterations. And I am building a color map here of just you know really bright primary uh, colors and uh, mixes of two primaries.
um, copy those colors off into the color map, and then launch the kernel. Now this triple chevron syntax, <coughs> it does some, it, it's, it's syntactic sugar, basically. It does some work for us that just saves us the boilerplate of having to do it ourselves. When we do the dynamic version of this program, we'll see that we're going to have to do that work ourselves, and we'll see what the corresponding code looks like uh, to do that work that the uh, automatically generated code for this, this host code that's calling a device kernel, we'll see what that corresponding code looks like. It's not too bad. Um, so we didn't look inside what this thing looks like yet. This iterate function is a device function, so it's only executing on the GPU. Um, and this is our loop per pixel. It's got um, a loop here that, you know, it's going to stop if it reaches the maximum number of iterations. It's got a bailout test that, dis that it uses to determine if we are guaranteed to be outside the set of interest and we're just going to exit early. Uh, and it's got a formula to compute the next value of z from the current value of z. Now you, you, you don't you can't quite see what's going on here and that's because I'm using the preprocessor and you'll see why I've done this in a second. I've, I've done this so that I can share the code between the static and the dynamic. Um, I've got the preprocessor defining that f iteration formula as a macro. And what we're going to do when we do dynamic compilation is we're, instead of providing this header file from the file system, we're going to build this header file contents from user input so we can change the formula that's being iterated. Um, now, uh, just go back to this formula for a second. You see I've written it naturally as z times z plus c. And back here, we saw that the data type of Z and of C were this, this complex data type, which I've defined in my little header file here. So it's a structure with the real and imaginary coordinate. It's got an assignment operator. It's got addition operator, a subtraction operator, a multiply operator, and a function to compute the squared magnitude of a complex value. Now, I could, if I want to allow for more fancier formulas, I could provide more operators. I didn't provide a divide, for instance. I haven't provided any trig functions and so on. I can, I, I can implement those and, in this code and have uh, a, a fully featured complex data type that runs on the GPU. And you might just be asking yourself, why didn't I just include complex.h? And the answer is because complex.h, or sorry, just complex, the C++ header for, co for the uh, complex number type. And the reason that I didn't include that is because when I'm doing runtime compilation, I don't have a C++ compiler installed, so I don't have a C++ standard library, so I don't have the complex C++ standard library header. Um, now, certainly you could scrape together enough stuff from an open source standard library implementation to allow you to have enough junk that you could transitively include all the things that you need, but uh, notice that these functions are marked with the device attribute to indicate to CUDA that they're going to execute on the device. In the MVRTC library, if you read the documentation carefully, you'll see that the default uh, execution context of any code that it sees is host, so which which matches NVCC. So it's matching the semantics of NVCC. So how are you going to get standard library headers to have all the functions annotated to operate on the device? Um, again with an open source standard library you could just edit all those files but I, I, I've, it, it's something to consider that when you're doing dynamic runtime compilation you're going to need to provide um, implementations of any data types and any data structures that you use that are sufficiently annotated so that they run on the device and in the device execution context 
they compile rather to the device execution context rather than the host execution context. Okay, so that's what complex looks like. Um, we looked at formula. This was just a cheat so I could get a way to substitute in a piece of text right here on the inner loop of the iteration. And this header file just declares this iterate function. That's all it's doing. So when we run this um, for offline compilation, all those files are just listed as part of my th the list of source files for my executable and my main CMake list. When I declared the project, I declared this project supported CUDA and CXX languages. So when CMake ran at configure time, it made sure that I had an appropriate MVCC compiler to be able to compile those things. So it can compile these CU source files. I've got two here. And um, one extra wrinkle is that when you're doing multiple CUDA source files that you want to link together, into a single executable, you need to set this uh, target property, CUDA separable compilation, to on, and that will invoke MVCC appropriately so that um, the, the the right flags are passed to the different translation units so that they can be linked together. Otherwise, you'll get a weird uh, link error. You get like multiply defined symbols and stuff like that. Uh, this uh, GUI library that I'm depending on from Optics Toolkit. That's just the thing that lets me display that stuff in a window really easily. Um, and uh, oh, I guess technically I should have inside here this error library that I'm also using up there. Uh, or am I? Am I using it? Yes, I'm, I'm using it when I initialize CUDA here. Um, so technically I should have that in there. It's a header only library, so it didn't matter. I think it came in transitively as a, it's a dependency of this GUI library anyway, so I got, I got it okay. Um, if I didn't, if I didn't get it transitively from here, I would have gotten a compile error on my C++ source files when I tried to include the, the headers for that error library. At any rate, that's what the static version looks like. So, Let's review what we had there. This launcher thing, we can't we can't compile this because it's a host function. So whatever is going whatever is going on in here, including this magic syntactic sugar with the triple chevron, we're going to have to do that ourselves. Uh, otherwise, this is um, a function marked as a global. This is our entry point that we're going to have to figure out how to invoke. Uh, functions that are marked global are uh, valid CUDA entry points as opposed to just ordinary un, you know func device functions that are um, they're just marked as executing on the device there you, you can't invoke a device function directly you can only invoke global functions and if you've got sharp eyeballs you might have noticed that this is declared X turn C and the reason for that is when we do all this stuff at runtime, we're going to need to supply the name of this function that we're after so we can get a handle on it and then invoke it. And if we didn't declare this function x turn C, then because this is C++, the function would be uh, so-called name mangled. So it would have additional text in the function name that indicated all the types and numbers of these arguments and the return type and the nested namespace. And because all that stuff, all that name mangling is compiler dependent and it can even change from release to release of a compiler, although they try not to do that because it breaks lots of stuff. Uh, because it's compiler dependent, so we're going to declare this X turn C and that will inhibit any name mangling of this symbol when we go to try and fetch it at runtime. So let's take a look at, um, and I'll just show you really quickly, but look at the CMake list. Now, all these source files, they all live in the same directory. 
and you'll notice that um, there's a bunch of stuff that's the same and there's some stuff that's different so our uh, main function our main entry point is different uh, I've got this little piece of C++ code that's going to do the equivalent of that triple chevron launch and all that so that's only used in the dynamic case because I'm going to cheat and I'm going to grab the contents of the source files off of my uh, file system in my from my source tree th there's other options I could have taken those source files and turned them into embedded character array resources and and access them that way but what I'm going to do is just I'm just going to read them off the uh, file system so I've got a little uh, configured file here got a little template that just is going to give me the location in my source tree on my machine of where the source files live I'm gonna configure that at CMake configure time to generate that little source file this little header file source dirt h just is a declaration for the generated code I'm gonna include that generated code from the binary dir in uh, as part of my project and then I'm gonna use nvrtc and nv JIT link the just-in-time linker I'm going to use those libraries, but they uh, didn't already have error check support in the Optics Toolkit error library that I'm using. So I just I've added my own little extension there. Um, because my generated source file is going to include a header file from my source directory, I need to make sure that my source directory is in the set of include directories for this target and my target is going to link against um, this error library the little GUI library that just does the show window for me and then uh, I didn't show it up here but up here or did I do it there maybe I got lazy uh, I should have had a uh, fine package for the CUDA toolkit but optics toolkit did it for me so that's how I got these imported targets for uh, MVRTC and MVJitLink uh, if we say CMake help module find CUDA toolkit you'll see that it has a bunch of stuff describing the search behavior and that it defines a bunch of imported targets for the various libraries in the CUDA toolkit so that's how we're getting that's how we're getting the uh, MVRTC library and the JITLINK library to depend on those by depending on those imported targets the corresponding include directories get added to the search path and you know everything just works so oops how is this dynamic one different from the static one we'll just drill in again from the top we'll look in here start with our main this parts pretty much the same except I'm doing a little argument validation because I'm going to require that you supply the underlying iterating formula to be used as a command line argument uh, otherwise things are very similar we're gonna initialize CUDA create an output buffer just like we did before map that output buffer we're gonna call uh, I've named it the same but there's a different implementation obviously because it's got a new argument now it's taking this uh, formula argument but we're gonna render our fractal into the output buffer and then unmap that output buffer and then just like before create an image buffer and display it from the output buffer so if I switch to making this the startup project and I show you what my command line argument is right now I've got it set to Z squared plus C I've got quotes around it because I've got embedded spaces in there and I want that whole thing to go as the single argument so if we run this program oops debugging breakpoint still set okay so same image as we got with the static version but if I change this argument if instead of z, uh, z squared plus c I say uh, z to the fourth 
So z times z times z times z plus c. And I run that. I get a different image. So what did it take to do that? Uh, if we look at here, the, the interesting bit happens in this rendering function. So um, uh, if you're curious, when I upload this code, I've got MVJIT link turned on right now, but you can switch it to um, not do the JIT linking and just compile a single source file. But because uh, I wanted to demonstrate JIT linking, I've got uh, I've got it compiling two source files and then linking them together. Uh, oops, too far. Here we go. So um, first thing I'm going to do is read my header files off of the disk into strings. Now, when you invoke NVRTC, uh, it's there's no preprocessor. Your application is the preprocessor. And what you do with NVRTC is that whenever it encounters an include directive, and this is the same whether it's include with quotes or include with angle brackets, it'll take the file name as it appears in your source code, and it'll look that up in a basically a map that you've create that you've passed to NVRTC it'll look up that included file name but in that map and grab a corresponding string for that name and that's what it will inject into the compilation process instead of grabbing a file off of disk now it's also possible to have it um, read header files from disk if you so desire I mean if you have many many header files it may not be advantageous to read them into memory just so you can pass them to MVRTC and then drop them out of memory so there is a way that you can have it read files off of disk and you do that by uh, just like you would with a normal compiler you pass the dash I flag to give it a directory to search for include files so you can have it read include files from disk. I'm reading them into memory and just passing their contents as strings. So let's take a look at what this uh, read headers does. And in my case, I happen to know which headers I'm including. Uh, I'm including these uh, vector types.h and vector functions.h. These are header files that ship with the CUDA SDK and they provide the vector oriented data types like float for, you care for, so on. In MVRTC, those data types are already built in intrinsically, so you don't need to include a header file to define them. But if you're going to use those data types in host code, you include vector types.h so you can have a, essentially what amounts to a struct uh, with the appropriate um, members, like for uh, float for, the members are x, y, z, and w. If it's a th float three, they're just X, Y, Z, and so on. Uh, if you want to use those data structures on the host, you because they're not intrinsic to C++, they're intrinsic to CUDA, it, the vector types.h and vector functions.h make the types and uh, corresponding functions available on the host. They're built in to CUDA when you compile with MVRTC, so I am just saying if you attempt to include that file, the corresponding contents is just an empty string. Uh, otherwise, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to this this get header guy will go and figure out the source pa the source path to that header file. So find the the, the full location to that source file, that header file in my source tree and then this little file contents guy will just open an input stream and then you know slurp the whole things into a string and return that. Um, my little header structure here is just a name and the contents. So for params.h, iterate.cuh, complex.cuh. I'm going to read those off of disk, turn their contents into strings, stick them in that little vector of header structures, 
And then for this formula.cuh, if we go back here and look at the static version, that uh, formula CUH was the thing that was defining the formula that's iterated in the inner loop. So for that special case, I've got a raw string literal here that defines the first part, and then I'm going to paste in the user input in the middle, and then I've got another raw string literal that contains the, the trailing part corresponding to my file on disk. So I'm cooking up its name is formula.cuh. That's going to be matched when the source code include tries to pound include formula.cuh. And then here's the contents that I'm going to supply for that header file. And that's how I'm getting my user input jammed into this CUDA code. And uh, these files I've stubbed out. This file, uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Didn't mean to edit. Uh, this file, uh, this fractal.h, if we look at what it does in the uh, static version, it's the thing that declares the host code that does the kernel launch. Now, in the runtime compilation case, we can't execute any host code. So we're just going to stub that guy out as empty as well. And um, for the purposes of the API, it wants arrays of stri raw string uh, raw character pointers pointers to care const care so these little transforms are just um, populating these vectors of raw pointers it's just populating those with the C string pointer for each of the contents and names of my little headers uh, I don't, you know, it's kind of one of these things where you, you've got a C style API that wants you to, you know, new up raw character buffers and pass in the pointer to the raw buffer. But I, you know, I'm not a fan of like raw character buffers hanging around because they kind of tend to create memory leaks. So um, I'm using the string for the actual storage and then I'm just using the transform algorithm to copy out the C string pointers for these strings into these arrays that I'm going to pass to MVRTC. So that's what we're doing in read headers. The next thing we're going to do is create uh, what's called a program in NVRTC from a source file on disk. So uh, we're going to go and read the contents of that. Uh, source file on disk so we've got that as this text argument and then this is just the name of the file um, it, it's just used for kind of diagnostic purposes inside uh, MVRTC it's not important it can be it can be empty string or null or they can all be the same it, it, it's just for um, I think I think honestly I think it just uses it for error messages or possibly uh, output in the PTX <clears throat> if things are annotated so when when you compile something if you've ever looked at the output of the preprocessor or the output of the compiler and looked at the assembly output there's oftentimes little comments in there that say this is the name of the source file and this is the line number that corresponds to this assembly instruction so it's probably used uh, this name here is probably used to emit similar kind of information inside PTX so in, in, in MVRTC, um, really what you do is you create program objects and then you manipulate those program objects. So they have a factory function that creates this program object and gives you back a handle to it. And then you can, it, when, you, when you create this program handle, you associate with it source code text. Uh, we're also passing in this map of header file names and um, header file contents pointers, right? So we're passing in um, the number of entries in the array and then two arrays of pointers. One array of pointers points to the contents of the headers 
and the other array of pointers points to the names of the headers. So that's its little map that it's going to use when we compile the source text and the source text has any pound include directives. And you have to account for all the pound include directives that appear transitively, right? If you include something that includes something else, you have to supply names for all of the things that are included or you have to specify a compile flag with a, like a dash I, uh, dash capital I uh, search option just to point it to a directory on disk where those files can be found. In our case, we're just going to have everything in memory. Um, we're going to query CUDA to find out what the, um, we'll just take a look at it here really quick. It's just going to build a string. So we're going to get device zero, then we're going to get the uh, capability major attribute and the capability minor attribute and use that to build this dash arch argument. So if you say dash arch equals SM50, that means that it was, um, sorry, SM, yeah, SM50. So it's major times 10 plus minor. So that means it's the 5.0, um, uh, streaming multiprocessor compute model. You know, we're just going to grab the highest one uh, the, according to what our device supports at runtime. So that's that little architecture option. Um, if we're doing just in time linking, then we need to pass some, um, th there's just kind of two code paths shown here with the, the pound ifs. Um, this Device link time optimization flag has to be passed if we're going to do just-in-time linking. This DC flag, and all, and all these flags uh, that I'm showing here, they're all documented on the MVRTC documentation. I'll just show you what that looks like briefly. Uh, got it over here. So the CUDA toolkit documentation. Uh, you don't need a developer account to see this documentation. You can just find it by Googling. But inside here, it is all described. Uh, supported compile options. So here's all the options in detail. And this one that we're passing DC is to support separate compilation because we have two compilation units that we're going to compile. Let's make this a little bigger so you can see that better. Uh, so the DC, this is the shorthand form, dash dash device dash C is the long form. We're going to specify that so we can do separate compilation. And like a, any C++ compiler, you can supply the definitions of macros to add values, or you can undefine macros. You can uh, specify include search paths, as I mentioned. So the, the kind of generic useful options for compiling C++ code can be supplied. Now here, what I'm doing is defining use launcher to be zero so that when I compile this source file, this code will be if deft out because it's host code and I can't successfully compile at runtime any code that is marked for the host. I want this part, but I don't want this part. So I've uh, set it up so that by default, use launcher will be defined to be one if it's not already defined. So when I'm in my static version of this code, it got this little host function. But in my dynamic version, I am turning that macro, or I'm setting that macro to a value of zero so that that host code is uh, omitted by the C preprocessor. Uh, and then I'm including my, my architecture option. So when you call uh, RTC compile program, it attempts to compile the source text that was associated with that program handle when we created the handle. You pass in your list of options. And notice here that we don't get to change the uh, header file stuff if you, if you need that to change more dynamically then you have to recreate the handle or you have to uh, go off of disk and using the dash I. Uh, so this is just a way of saying what are the number of options from that uh, initialized array and pass in the array of pointers. Uh, 
Now, uh, in in all, it just happens to be the case in all the NVIDIA APIs that the success status returned by all of their APIs evaluates to zero. So we can say, uh, take this variable, initialize it to this API call, and then evaluate the result of that variable. And if it's non-zero, that means we got an error. Now, if you had an API where um, success was indicated by a non-zero value and zero indicated uh, failure, you'd have to use that um, later version of C++ here where you, you know, have to say something like, you know, here's the initializing expression that declares a variable within the scope of the if statement, and then here's the, um, the, the condition that should be tested if the if statement is to be true. But with NVIDIA APIs, we don't need to do that. We can just say, uh, if it's non-zero, that means it got an error. Because when it got an error, that means we couldn't compile. So what we want to do is grab the compile log and uh, dump that out. And then um, this o OTK error check will take the non-zero status and turn it into an exception. So um, just always got to think about error handling when you're writing code. Like initially, I just had this as uh, OTK error check around this API call. And while that did turn the error into an exception, because I didn't print out the compilation log, I couldn't see why it was failing. So just, just something you always got to think about error handling when you're calling somebody else's API. Okay, so uh, let's just assume the compilation was successful. Then um, if we're going to do linking, we need to get this uh, so-called link time optimization intermediate representation that came that, that was the output of the compile process because we specified dash d lto up there so the result of this compilation process was this lto ir and uh, whatever the result of these uh, processes in mvrtc and an mvt jit link we'll see that in a second that you're you're it's always like you, if you're going to obtain a string from this thing First you query for the size, and then you allocate a buffer big enough to hold the, the data, and then you say, get me the data, and pass it a pointer to your buffer. So in my case, I'm just using strings. Um, I resize the string to whatever the size of the stuff is, and then I pass in the address of the first character of the string to get the, the buffer, the output buffer address that it's going to write into. In this case, I'm going to get this LTO IR. This is some opaque data type. I don't know what it actually is. I, I didn't try to look at it in the debugger, but I suspect it's not text. But we need to get this stuff out so that we can pass it to the linker. Once I've gotten that, the uh, result of the compilation process out of this MVRTC program, I don't need the program anymore. So I can destroy it. Um, and then I'm going to stash it, the, the output, into my little uh, vector of strings here, which is my global compilation output. When I'm doing, uh, when I'm not using the linker, I'm going to compile everything into PTX instead of LTOIR. Uh, and that's why this little flag is commented out in the uh, non-link branch of this code. Okay, so that was what that was create program. So we're gonna create one. Uh, we're gonna create an NVRTC program handle and compile it and get the LTO IR for iterate.cu and then for fractal.cu. And just to remind you what they look like, fractal.cu had the kernel entry point, and iterate. CU had the, the thing that iterated our formula repeatedly until it either bailed out or we reached maximum number of iterations. So we're going to create programs for each of those and obtain their LTO IR output. And then we're going to get the entry point 
that we're going to invoke using the CUDA driver API. Now, there's two APIs you can program to in CUDA, and you can mix them together. There's the CUDA runtime API, which is kind of more um, convenience layer on top of the CUDA driver API. And to launch kernels programmatically, you have to use the CUDA driver API. When you're using the CUDA runtime API, you're launching kernels using that triple chevron syntax. But um, you can mix and match the APIs and use, you can use either the, the driver API or the runtime API. There, there are some constraints, um, but they, because one is a layer on top of the other, they, they play nice together. But what I'm going to do is, uh, we'll look at this function in a second, but I'm going to attain the driver API CU function for my linked program that was created from these two source files. I'm going to build my parameters to the kernel. And then when I go to invoke the kernel, I have to pass the driver API, an array of pointers to the arguments. So let's go refresh ourselves on what the arguments look like. Uh, so the arguments are, uh, wrong one. We need to look at the, the kernel. So the arguments to the kernel are the width. So we've got the address of the width, we've got the height, we've got the address of the height, we've got a pointer to a UCARE4, this is a pointer, this is a device pointer, I mean it's it's written in, uh, in a regular C++ pointer to data type, but it's a pointer to a data type in the address space of the GPU. Uh, in our main driver code, we got that from the output buffer by mapping it. And so that we pass the address of the pointer. And then the final parameter was a struct passed by value. So we take the address of our struct and add that onto the list of arguments here. Uh, was there a question? No? Okay. Um, we build this array of void stars, and that's the arguments that we pass into the kernel when uh, this is the, the, the function that we're going to invoke on the GPU. And when we saw the, uh, the way the launcher worked over here, we were using this triple chevron syntax saying, here's the grid dimensions. It's a number of blocks, one comma one. And then the block dimensions was threads per block, one, one. And if we look back over here, we see the same thing going on. There's the number of blocks, one, one. Those are the grid dimensions. And then the threads per block, one, one. Those are the block dimensions. Uh, this. Uh, that zero, I, just give me the thing. Let's go this way. I just want to drill in. Here we go. Uh, and then shared memory that's being used, and then the stream if it's executing asynchronously, and then uh, the kernel params, and then there's uh, extra values that you can pass in. So there's our kernel params. Uh, we're not using a stream, so it's null pointer, and we're not using any shared memory. Now, you might ask yourself, like, wait, uh, how did it know the size of these things in order to figure out how to copy the data from the host into the device when it executes this kernel? And the answer is because it's bound up in this function type that represents the entry point. It knows from information stored in the compiled program the signature of the kernel that we are invoking. So it knows, for instance, we passed the address of the struct, but we didn't pass the size of the struct. Uh, 
but it knows from having compiled the source code representing that function that it, it already knows what the size of the struct is from the, the compilation. So we didn't need to tell it that. So the only thing we haven't talked about so far is this get entry point, which I have uh, two versions. I have the simple version, which just takes, um, if I'm not doing JIT compilation, I just take those two source files, I, I slurp them into memory as strings, I concatenate them together into one big string, and then I just compile that. And so there's no linking necessary, I just take a, the, the output of the compilation, which is only one string, and I load it into a module, and then I ask the module for the function corresponding to this symbol name, color pixel. If we're JIT linking, it gets a little bit more interesting. So again, I'm going to need to specify the uh, streaming multiprocessor architecture flag, the dash arch equals SM50 or whatever. I need to specify that link time optimization flag. The PTX flag specifies to the just-in-time linker that the output of the compilation should be PTX. Uh, this can only be done when you're using link time optimization, the PTX output form. So I'm going to create a linker handle based on those command line argument options. And then for each of the compilation outputs that I obtained, which previously we it was specified as LTOIR in the in the JIT link case, the LTO intermediate representation. So when I add the data to the link step, I'm adding them as JIT link input LTIO LTOIR. Uh, and I'm just passing in you know, the pointer to the string and the size of the string. I uh, forget what this last argument. Oh, there was, there's a name, again, a name here that you can supply just for diagnostic purposes. It, it probably helps if you're trying to use the CUDA debugger. Um, so after we've added all our inputs, we tell it to go ahead and finish off the link step. And then we're going to get the corresponding PTX size and get the corresponding PTX. Um, we will look at the uh, error log and if the if it was non zero, you know, it, it always has one character in it because the log always is a null terminated string. So it always has at least one character that's a, a null byte. So that's why we check to see if the log size is greater than one instead of greater than zero. And uh, we'll print out that log if we got one. Otherwise, we're done linking, so we can destroy this JIT handle. We don't need that anymore. We've obtained the output of the link by getting the PTX into a string. And then we're going to load that PTX into a CUDA module. This effectively creates the module from the PTX. It's, it, this is essentially a factory function, CU module load data. Uh, then we're going to get the entry point. And again, using that symbol name, and this is why we declared that symbol as X turn C, so that we could reference it by its unmangled name. And if all that was successful, then we uh, return this entry point. I guess prob technically I'm leaking the CUDA module here. I should probably destroy it. Uh, just so you know, you always don't leak resources. Always try and free up things. Uh, and that's how it all works. So we used MVRTC, told it about our include files, used that to compile to some intermediate representation. If we're not doing linking, then that intermediate representation is PTX. If we are doing linking, then the intermediate representation is this LTOIR. Uh, if we're not doing linking, then we haven't gotten the combined PTX we can uh, just load that straight into a module and get the entry point. Just to show you that this works without linking, this is the point where I'm slurping those two files together. Uh, just to show you that this works without linking as well, if we change this to zero, 
and run and build, we will get the same image as before. Same image. So, the, the important part is uh, if you're going to deal with uh, multiple translation units, multiple compilation source files, um, you got to be a little bit careful in how you link them together. Um, I didn't do any experiments of how to combine uh, source files that were compiled offline with source files that are compiled at runtime. That may be possible. I'm not entirely certain. Uh, I think uh, it, it, I think it may be possible, but I didn't do an experiment to validate that that was the case. Uh, but at any rate, it, here we're faking out the header files by reading them into strings off a of disk. Those strings could easily just be uh, embedded resources in my application that I'm shipping to a customer. Uh, and then we're creating MVRTC programs from those and then doing a compilation process to get an intermediate representation. And then we're taking those intermediate representations, linking them together using NVJitLink to get a module. And then from that module, we're able to get the kernel entry point. And then using the driver API, we can launch a kernel on that entry point. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay, well, then that ends the presentation.